Good evening, this is Michael. Thanks for tuning in. In this video, the last week I've been photographing and making time lapses of Comet Wurtenen. I'm going to show you how I did it and I'm going to show you all the results. Stay tuned. Well, good evening. It's Thursday, December 13th, and I'm driving out to the middle of freaking nowhere. Story of my life. Seems to be a thing I like to do. It is today the peak of the Gemini meteor shower, uh, but that's not really what I'm after this time. I got my fill of that last year. I got a fill of Perseids earlier this year. Today and over the weekend that's upcoming, we can see Comet 46P Wurtanen. Um, this is one of the closest approaching comets in a very long time. Um, certainly one of the 10 closest in, uh, I don't know, the last 100 years or the space age. I'm not sure what uh, clickbaity statistic we're using right now. I just turn on a camera and I start talking and spend a lot of time editing and trying to make sense of what I just rambled on about. So anyway, I've uh, been checking the weather for days, trying to make sure that uh, I have some kind of a game plan to stay where the sky is going to be clear. The goal is to uh, take hours long time lapse videos of the comet. You see when comets are really close to the earth like this one is, uh, they can actually, they, they move like quickly, not just a little bit, but very quickly across the sky, across the background stars. So very easily you can just take pictures every you know, a few every minute and stitch them all together and then you've got a video of the comet moving across the background of stars. I'll do some tripod shots, but I also have a tracking camera, a tracking mount that I'll be using to follow the stars so the stars will seem to freeze in place so that you can actually get a sense of how fast the comet is moving against the background of stars. It's not something you can see in real time. Um, but uh, if you time lapse it, it's really quite noticeable. So not only do I need to figure out where to go to be uh, away from clouds, I need to go somewhere that I'm away from city lights. Uh, the less light pollution, the better. Uh, there are plenty of really good tools out there for figuring out where to go in order to avoid light pollution. I'll uh, post some links in the description. And I'll also be, probably throughout this video somewhere, I'll show you uh, what that looks like, what some of those tools look like. Now, each day this weekend is gonna be a little bit more interesting than the last because the comet is getting closer and closer to Earth, which means it's getting brighter, but also getting bigger in the viewfinder. Degrees of sky is concerned, or arc minutes of sky. Um, the size of the comet is bigger than what the full moon looks like in the sky. So. Uh, in fact, the comet is quite large when you consider its atmosphere. Uh, the comet is actually really small. Uh, 46P Wirtanen is a very small comet. It's only a kilometer across. So, oh, that's like walking across your neighborhood. It's it's not big at all. Um, it doesn't. It's not big enough, um, and it's not getting close enough to the sun to produce a classic tail. Uh, instead, gas coming off the comet. I believe it's uh, cyanogen bromide. I'll double check that here later. Uh, cyanogen uh, glows green when it becomes ionized in the solar wind or by solar particles. Um, cyanogen, cyan, uh, cyan is a greenish blue and it turns out that cyanogen has that name because it produces a green glow when it's struck by solar wind or some sort of ionizing uh, electrical field. So I'm driving out of town. I am gonna go about, I don't know, half an hour outside of town. Uh, where I live, uh, I only have to go about 30 to 40 miles and I'll go from a red zone, a red light pollution zone, to a dark blue, which is a, it doesn't seem like it, but that's a massive improvement. Um, the difference is being able to see a few familiar constellations, like you can kind of pick out Orion and you can pick out the Big Dipper, to being able to see tens of thousands of stars. It's a monumental difference. It makes all the difference in the world when you're doing uh, night sky photography or just enjoying the sky with your own eyes or through a telescope or with a pair of binoculars. 
Comet 46P Wirtanen uh, is what they consider naked eye visible. But I think it's only in principle that it's really naked eye visible. The magnitude of the comet, that's how much light it's giving off, is the sum total of the entire comet and its atmosphere, its, its, its nucleus, its uh, the, the green cyanogen uh, atmosphere that's coming off of the uh, comet. Uh, all of that combined has a equivalent brightness to a third magnitude star. Uh, now, a third magnitude star is fairly easy to pick out. It's some of the more dim stars in the Big Dipper, for example. When it's diffused like this, when, when it's spread out, it's not really quite that visible. In fact, you can't even see the green color with your own eyes. It's too dim. But through a pair of binoculars, you can see all that. And if you photograph it, you can see that. Now, I did mention that it's uh, the Geminid meteor shower right now as well. Um, if I'm lucky enough, uh, while I'm photographing the comet, I might see uh, a Geminid meteor streak on by the viewfinder. That'd be great. I, that'd be awesome. Here's a here here's a meteor generated by uh, the dust from the tail of a comet with a comet in frame. It's sort of a, a neat little juxtaposition, if you will. Okay, so I'll just keep driving. I'll get into position, get these lights off so I can see well, and uh, I'll see you when I get out there. Alright, day two of the shenanigans with the comet. Alright, this yesterday I got started a little later. Uh, it was probably about 9.30 when I started recording uh, some time-lapse photos. This time I'm leaving at 5.15. The sun has been set for half an hour already at 4.15. Yay. We are in the depths of winter. So I'm getting ready to drive to my dark sky location. I'm gonna go a little bit further out this time, away from town, uh, try and uh, get some much darker skies. Well, not much darker, it'll just be a little darker. Uh, today we'll be fighting a little bit more moonlight and for a little longer. Um, it probably won't set until, oh, I don't know, 11 o'clock or so. It's really high in the sky right now. Half right now, half moon, 50%. It's a little bother us for a little bit, but, um, most meteors, most geminid meteors will be bright enough to see anyway, and the, the comet is plenty bright enough uh, that it'll show up. In fact, uh, yesterday, uh, once the moon had almost completely set, I was able to see the comet naked eye this time. Um, it's faint, very faint. So the comet is now naked eye visible, uh, just ever so slightly. Um, I could see it once the moon went down and by using averted vision. Uh, averted vision means um, that you don't look directly at the faint thing that you're trying to see. You look just offset from it. For whatever reason, and this has to do with the cones and rods in your eyes, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, those rods, the, they, they pick up light a little better just around the very center of your field of vision for some reason. Yesterday I got some narrow angle shots and some wide angle shots, a bunch of which I ruined. Uh, the, 
the new camera that I have, the way the shutter cable comes out of it, it actually points at the lens. And if you don't do it right, and especially if uh, your wire is extremely stiff because it's cold, uh, it can get in front of the lens, Ugh, which is very frustrating. Um, I got at least five different, six different or so uh, meteors on uh, film, four of which uh, you can actually see the comet and a geminid meteor in the same frame, which is pretty slick. It's actually what I was hoping for. Um, I think I may have mentioned that last night even. Anyway, let's uh, get out there. I'm gonna get some coffee and a little quick bite to eat and get out there and we'll uh, get started. All right, see you then. This is far from my first attempts at astrophotography. In fact, for a number of years I operated an observatory in my backyard. For example, here's M45, the Pleiades, taken through an 80 millimeter refractor. It's the result of stacking multiple images over several nights, which can pull out the faintest of nebular clouds. But comets are a bit tougher to pull this off with. They are challenging to stack because they move relative to the stars. Over the last decade, I photographed a half dozen comets, and here's a few of those examples. Wurtanen isn't the biggest, and it isn't the brightest of these. Panstars, from five years ago, was definitely the most impressive. But for what Wurtanen lacks in size and brightness, it makes up for in speed. Its close approach to Earth is what really makes that possible. All right, it's my third day going at this. Uh, it's actually starting to get old. Um, probably the fifth or sixth, sixth time I've been out, third day in a row, third evening in a row. It's uh, it's a little bit after nine o'clock, and this time I've got both cameras on the tracking mount. Being out in the cold, it's all about staying warm. Wear gloves if you've got them. I've got something right over there. Hat, hood, big uh, winter jacket, snow pants, layer up. Uh, I've got long underwear on. Uh, and jeans. I probably could stand to put snow pants on, although it's only 31 degrees this time, so it's a lot better than previous nights. But it's windy too. Anyway, I'll show you what I got. Okay, right here is the Ioptron Skyguider Pro, and it is a tracking mount. There's a little motor in here that uh, slowly turns uh, this apparatus on an axis. This axis needs to be pointed directly at the North Celestial Pole, which is very close to Polaris. Uh, there's a little telescope inside of it that you can look through to help you line it up with Polaris. And then on the top and bottom, you can mount cameras. Um, there's several different configurations this will work. You can put a telescope on top and a camera. You can put two cameras on it. Um, you can do just a single camera. So I'll show you what that looks like. All right, so there you have it. Two cameras, 
Both cameras can be adjusted to point at alternate targets. Um, one can be pointed at one part of the sky and another at another, and they can have different focal length lenses. And you can do two combinations at the same time this way. Sometimes you need to tighten your stuff a little better. So yeah, in some cases I was able to photograph the comet with two different cameras and two different lenses at the same time. Just like that. Flip on the switch, and away it goes. Uh, up here I have a Canon uh, 6D Mark II um, with a Rokinon 85mm f1.4, which is a nice little light bucket. That'll collect as many photons as this lens will uh, in half the time. Uh, this one's a 55 to 70 millimeter Sigma f2.8 uh, lens, and this one's much sharper than the 85 millimeter, but uh, it's only an f2.8. It collects half as much light in a given amount of time. This camera is an older T1i. This T1i is older, but it's special. Um, it's had its uh, botter filter removed from the sensor. That way it can collect hydrogen alpha light waves. Um, so in some of my photographs, you'll see uh, different objects that uh, are very red coming through in the photograph much nicer than they will from this camera. Um, I have a T3i as well. Uh, however, that one I busted kayaking up in Canada. Hopefully here soon I'm going to uh, get that one working again and maybe I'll modify that one like I did this T1i. This 6D was my replacement camera from busting the T3i. So. I spent this last week photographing the comet with these two cameras and this mount, and all the photos and videos that you saw were done doing this. Uh, some of my photos you might have noticed uh, the stars move quickly across the screen. Uh, those shots were taken from a tripod uh, in order to actually show the motion of the sky. Well hopefully this setup will show up uh, in uh, future videos and you'll get to see more of the, uh, uh, more of the photos that I take of uh, the night sky in the coming months. This mount can also be used as a uh, time-lapse uh, panning mount. Uh, <laughs> Tucker. Uh, this can be used as a time-lapse panning mount. All you have to do is lay it down flat and it'll spin around. You, know, you attach a camera uh, in a normal orientation and the camera will track across the horizon at whatever you're trying to time-lapse. Anyway, that's what I did and uh, that's how I made it. If you like this video, hit the like button. And if you want to see more of this, hit subscribe. I'll be bringing this out more in the next couple of months and I'll have even more cool stuff to show you. Thanks for watching. Get outside and learn something new.